So this is a you know round table discussion on methodological issues, and uh, we have received many questions actually. Uh, but we don't have much time. I don't want to actually go to like 2, 2 a.m. Pacific time or whatsoever. So I limit to, I mean, I target probably at 30, 35 minutes and then uh, probably, you know, usually over time. Uh, actually, you know, this is very relevant to what I teach. Many students stop by my office and uh, ask questions. Oh, how do I handle, you know, this endogeneity issues? You know, there are problems of data. You know, how can I merge it to data sets? You know, actually my most frequent answer is just guess. What is my most frequent answer when people ask that kind of questions? My number one remedy, my answer is ignore it. Just ignore it, okay? So, <laughs> so that's my number one answer. And the uh, number two answer is, uh, well, give up. You know, you cannot write dissertation on this topic. So, <laughs> So it's uh, like two extreme cases. One is uh, just to ignore this problem, or second is, uh, oh, you cannot do, you know, you cannot do this, right? So <laughs> we actually have to find some solution between these two extreme uh, <laughs> answers. But actually, this is true. I mean, I, I mean, these are my two most frequent remedies or answers when people ask questions about, you know, data and, uh, you know, endogenous issues. So having said that, actually, let's go to these three topics. I mean. Uh, uh, this is actually uh, uh, written by Ron. So we have so many other uh, issues, but uh, we'll probably talk about some uh, methodological issues. So one issue uh, is about- Sonia, uh, I, so I thought we were gonna let Bernard in, uh, yeah, right. <coughs> respond. And, sure. and That's the first Robert. issue. That's the first oh. issue. Oh, okay. So the first issue is about the, the, why, the when data come from multiple surveys, right? So what are the issues that arise from uh, this uh, multiple surveys and uh, when the uh, variable is poor? So that's actually very relevant to a uh, Bernard paper. So I'll give you actually time to respond to the comment. Bernard? Um, thank you, Sanghai. Uh, yes, I think, I I would also do it like you that sometimes we cannot do much about it actually with the data and we have to be always aware also of course this endogeneity issues are important but we have to be aware that most of the or the many of the age profiles we are estimating are actually based on on assumptions uh, we we using data in the best possible way but without having this strong assumption, how much is consumed by children. And so we would, it would be completely impossible to get estimates. And uh, regarding the comments by Michael, the, uh, in, I don't know if you have made the experience, but my experience with NDA is in the end, at, the age prof also at least the age profiles, uh, with the microdata, with other type of analysis, it might be different. They're really robust. So even if we change the assumptions or I use different method, in the end, the outcome was pretty much the same. And so I also think that this is regarding the, the intra-household uh, profiles or intra-household transfers that no matter how we impute it, we capture basically the transfers from parents to children. And independent of the exact method, we get a kind of the same age profiles. For Austria, uh, I didn't use the household head assumptions anymore because uh, this is important, of course, for transfers, which are recorded only at household level. But I don't have such such transfers because I was using tech statistic data and all these transfers, for example, child benefits are there given at individual level already. And also for asset in the survey, we had the information on who in the household uh, actually owns the asset. So, but anyway, I, I think that even if I use a different uh, assumption regarding the distribution within the household, the basic age profiles of the inter-household transfers were the same. And with the imputation of the consumption in the income survey, there were 
<laughs> that's of course a very difficult one. Even more or less, we cannot uh, account for the mean or standard deviation of the of the consumption because we just don't know it or observe it. If we take into account in the imputation the variation we observe in the survey, we have again this variation across the two weeks periods, and this is what we want to get out of the out of the consumption, as out of the imputed values. We want to have some kind of uh, yeah, best would be the, the observation of consumption over the whole year, but we do not have it. So to some sense, we have to aggregate and we cannot simply impute the variation in consumption, which we observe in the survey. And so far, I, I don't know of any method which statisticians would agree perfectly that this is the perfect one. But maybe you have some some suggestions how to do it in a better way. So now that's all I have to say. Thank okay. you for your comments. Okay, thanks, uh, 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 Robert, Carl. You yeah, can you respond to your uh, other questions because you didn't have the time to respond, and I know that you are eager to actually say something. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you uh, for. Um, Please make it brief. Uh, the, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the opportunity. Um, uh, I had a comment uh, by Luis about uh, the definition of parenthood, and um, I think there is some some general aspect uh, uh, in this question of uh, uh, how uh, to make a micro level NTA of time variant characteristics. So when you split NTA by gender, gender doesn't change over time. Um, uh, that's, um, that's, that's a much simpler issue. Uh, uh, income is time variant. So uh, uh, you start, uh, even if you are higher educated, uh, you start with a lower uh, uh, income and then your income will increase over time. And that's the same uh, with uh, parenthood. Um, so your uh, uh, number of children first increases and then decreases uh, as uh, they, uh, they, they move out. And um, uh, using completed fertility would be tricky uh, in a way that uh, you simply uh, cannot tell uh, at the age of 20 or 25 or 30 uh, of a person uh, uh, what uh, her or his completed fertility will be. Um, so it would be, um, it, it would be a major challenge to, to, to split the population by uh, completed fertility. So in a sense, um, uh, the um, this residence or cohabitation based uh, parenthood definition uh, uh, is reasonable. So it's not just data driven. There, there is, of course, an aspect of that. Uh, we simply don't have a data set that, uh, that includes information about completed fertility and all these uh, consumption or, or income issues uh, uh, we need. Now, um, uh transitions yeah this this is uh, what what i mentioned uh the gender issue that uh, that was raised by uh, by by james uh we uh, we we did not include gender here and um um yeah i have i have always been um uh, skeptical uh, about uh, uh, gender nta uh, uh, honestly, uh, because uh, uh, most of the time, uh, that was my repeated uh, uh, experience, NTA uh, uh, analysis produced uh, age profiles split by gender separately for, for men and women, and then the conclusions were derived uh, uh, for the aggregates. And that's what something we knew already uh, 
it, it was uh, present in the literature for decades. Uh, in fact, the whole methodology of um, uh, uh, using time use surveys was developed for uh, uh, demonstrating uh, the, the, the gender effect. Uh, and uh, uh, NTA, so uh, introducing age uh, into this gender issue, uh, uh, added only, only uh, quite little. I, I wouldn't say that it, it didn't add anything. Uh, the, the, there was the, the, the study by, uh, by, by Bernard and, and, and company, which, uh, uh, which, which calculated stocks um, uh, over an entire life cycle um, uh, by, by gender. So when, uh, again, it comes to parenthood, um, uh, I think we would just repeat what, uh, uh, what the literature uh, knows already, that uh, uh, the contribution by fathers and mothers uh, uh, is, uh, is, is rather different. Robert? And, yeah. Can you make okay. it uh, brief, actually? No, no, okay, I, I think I, I, yeah, I can, I can finish. Oh, that. okay. You're done? Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we actually go back to this, uh, these issues. We have actually have uh, many actually methodological issues. So let's just go directly to the first question again, you know, while, you know, this first question is actually related to the second question. So, the, what are the issues arise when data are, uh, source I mean, from come from multiple surveys. So many countries have these issues. And uh, I actually want to point out uh, another thing. Uh, you know, if you read the manual very clearly, I mean, I, I believe that Gretchen wrote to that part. You know, when you use a multiple survey, you sh there are some ways to handle that. And for example, suppose you merge like uh, income and, uh, you know, consumption data. Uh, but the one issue is that one, once you impute the number, you cannot uh, uh, you know, ent estimate NT by subgroups. So we discourage it very strongly, right, from doing that. So Bernard, actually, I think your presentation second part is uh, based on subgroup, right? So parents with the children and, and, and so on. But according to our manual, manual does not, I mean, manual actually discourage it because of the distribution issues. Gretchen, do you have something to say about this? Do you remember it? Yeah, I do. I mean, <clears throat> I think the point was not to say that you can't do it, but that if you are going, I mean, if, so if you have sort of proxy variables that you can use for everything and can use that standard deviation method and everything, then I think you're sort of in good shape because you have lots of individual level variation that you didn't bake in there yourself um, that uh, you'll be able to exploit for subgroup things. But if, you're, if they're completely separate and you're sort of trying to jam them together with some big imputation or hot deck or something like that, you just have to make sure that any covariate or any subgroup that you're doing is part of that. So, I mean, I think that's the only point. And if I wrote it, you know, if I, if when I wrote that section, I was more dire about the prospects of doing this uh, reasonably well, then that's, I apologize, <laughs> I did a disservice to it. It just means that if you're going to split things out, you have to have, by some covariate, you have to have had that in your imputation or you're just sort of, you know, flinging stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And then it's just going to be random. Yeah. Okay. So it's actually interesting because uh, we have a manual, NTA manual. We have also manual for like NTTA, but we don't have a manual or agreement on how we divide, right? The, what are the problems when we use two di different data sets or when we use micro files? So anyone actually have some, I mean, suggestions? Should we have a working group on that? Because, uh, you know, this is actually first meeting we talk about this and uh, we do not have any kind of manual or some guidelines. Or doing that. Well, except that, I mean, I think that the Latin American group like years ago, like a lot of years ago, 
did this across countries with education at least uh and i mean is there like a technical working paper or something that there probably is does anybody or maybe i'm mistaken about that can i just say um in the uk there's a, a project there's the recent papers by thomas crosley um published he's a uh, professor here oxford and i can't remember where else uh but he's got he's got a couple of papers recent papers working papers on this imputation issue and how to correct for that so it's just a reference okay thanks actually also the christoph carroll and john Hopkins. actually he published a book with uh, so many contributors about you know, they actually they are talking about all these kind of issues when there are two data sets and they have a, one is based on income, the other is consumption. They have a different distribution. How do you, I mean, you know, measure, I mean, merge two data sets. So uh, there are a bunch of actually uh, kind of references. Uh, so we can actually exchange the references about these issues too. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, that would be really good to gather up and just sort of put on the workshop page. Sure. It would help me. Anyone? Just uh, unmute to your, uh, I mean, microphone and you can just speak. I, I think we have, uh, yeah, it's very manageable How about this issue. Oh. Hyungyeong, you raised the hand or? Okay. Actually, uh, I can't. Can you ra raise the volume a little bit? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Hear me? Okay. Yeah. Actually, I construct the life cycle JP divided by gender and regional. And yeah, uh, in my experience, I think that. Oh, uh, two types is different. First of all, gender is not, uh, gender is deterministic, not change. But region, region is change. So, oh, uh, people move to another region. So, uh, comparing the time series data, the, uh, it is very common in the case of region. In addition, the macro control doesn't exist by group. So actually, I use the regional GDP uh, divided by region. And so macro control probably in the case of region, I use the re regional GDP. But uh, gender, in the, in the case of gender, I don't have a macro control. So I ca calculate using microdata. So, so actually, uh, I think that the several assumptions is needed to divide the group. So, uh, in the case of gender, uh, I assume that the, my, the gender portion of microdata and gender portion of the general account is the same to make the macro control. In addition, uh, in the case of regional NT, uh, I assume that the people don't move a uh, certain period. So, so uh, yeah, in addition, I don't have a data for a uh, transition between Regional. So in the national level, we have, uh, we use uh, the inter international, uh, international uh, account data, but in the case of region, we don't have a data, so I estimate it. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, when we actually uh, split the data, region is more difficult because of people commute to, right? Right. Uh, but, yeah. But the gender, I mean, you know, when we use like multiple surveys or break down the data, the gender is okay, right? Because yeah. it, as you mentioned, it's deterministic. But right. how about by education? Because uh, actually, Ron, 
showed the you know like income by education, but the education like uh, you know has changed substantially. So there are so much uh, you know enrollment, right? Uh, increase in college enrollment. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. so uh, and, Okay, so uh, how do you, I mean, these are, I mean, just two very typical questions when we compare across time and uh, when we use data sets, uh, because a high school graduate in 1970s might be a much higher, I mean, intelligent than <laughs> college graduate these days. <laughs> well, and maybe, I don't know um, if Michael is still here because he was working on the U.S. data with us and was looking at a lot of the education distributions and uh, and you know we had talked about using relative education but it's so chunky you know it's so so not continuous that it's uh it's hard to split up and make a relative measure that uh that functions well i don't know if michael's still here if he wants to talk about that at all uh. Yeah, my yeah. Ah. yeah, so so we used, um, I can't remember the name of that paper, What, but what we did was to, well, the one thing was to split it with the observed levels, like you have uh, post BA and undergraduates and high school levels. But another way to do it is, uh, based on this paper, is that um, it's like you're sorting people by level and then if you, if the percentile is somewhere in that big chunk, you just, uh, just like a random split of somewhere in that big chunk. And who's ever in one group and the other group is purely random. So that, that's another way to do it. Okay. Uh, we can actually, uh... I mean, link, we can uh, talk about the second issue. This is also very, I mean, this is a related issue, actually. I can hear some echo. Can you, uh, let's see. Somebody, okay. Uh, just a second. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, so, uh, Bernard, are you raising your hand or scratching your head? Okay. <laughs> All right. So the the next topic is very. I mean, it's related with the first topic. And uh, when you uh, include data for profiles uh, that do not come from household surveys, like public education and publicly provided healthcare, how do you handle that in a cons consistent way? So. It's uh, related, but somewhat different questions, right? Or something else. I mean, you know, indirect taxes, for example, when you construct a intra-household transfer, you probably don't know How about tax. I mean, Hippolyte actually says something about the tax, right? It's calculated at the individual level, but suppose you don't have any information. But I mean, the obvious uh, question is uh, how do you, I mean, the, like public education consumption. Have you, has any country have done anything about this? So uh, in the US, the, oh, sorry, was I jumping yeah, the gun, Hippolyte? Go ahead, and, and, and followed by Hippolyte, yeah. Yeah, um, just the, the only thing that I have about public education, I have enrollment, which is almost universal, so whoop de doo no help there. Um, but then also is state to state variation in per pupil spending, but that only does a little bit because the United States has this perverse public school financing thing where we use local property taxes to fund schools. So there's lots of within state, um, inequality there that uh, isn't, you know, picked up by that method, but I don't, you know, it's, it's just sort of too overwhelming to go district by district and, you know, and I just don't have that kind of geographic level in my survey. So state to state is sort of all I get. Okay, and go ahead. Yeah, Hippolyte. 
so so yes uh, so maybe I'm, I'm missing the point huh? but um, since the very beginning uh, uh, of the project uh, for France we are using multiple survey okay so uh, uh, we are trying to get uh, all the information which is available in the many surveys that we have in France and then uh, we could compute some uh, average per age Okay. And then we make sure that everything, you know, rescale, you know, to the aggregate. So, so I do not, at this point, I do not see really the point of having multiple surveys. I understand that uh, if uh, we are dealing with a distributional issue, then uh, you do have to, uh, uh, if you collect information from various surveys, you have uh, to pull basically this information in order to recreate, you know, for each individual. Uh, some uh, uh, something which is consistent and this is complicated so I feel that uh, uh, as uh, as long as those distributional issues are, um, are, um, are in stake you know then we should have a common variable in all those survey in order to uh, to create you know uh, something which is consistent Okay. And I guess that income, uh, maybe that labor income should be sufficient. Okay. Which uh, is an issue for the retiree. Huh? But maybe I miss the point, you know. So no, no, no. It's, a, it's a actually a very important topic because we are using like a micro files of NTA. And there are many issues like this. Uh, for example, in your paper, you or look at the, in, you know, within like AJ, within variation. But, but between variation is uh, probably very difficult to address, right? Between age group because it's so bumpy and uh, we are using smoothed profiles. So it's actually, a, I mean, Ryan's question in, in the past, I mean, when you use micro data, it's sometimes very bumpy because uh, you know, the number of observations is small and leads to a quite uh, high in whatever, right? Variation within some age groups. Uh, have you ever had uh, some thought about that? Have you thought about some? So, so of course, the, the, the limited number of, info, of observation per age is really an issue as long as you are uh, um, looking uh, uh, at a problem like a distribution by, uh, let's say, by educational groups. And that's why in our previous paper, we are only building basically uh, the, uh, the average for uh, uh, what we call the low educated person who are those who do not have a college degree. Because we do have enough information per age group in order to have something which is quite consistent. But we were not, hein, even with the French survey, which are quite uh, detailed, we were not able to compute the average for the higher education, for instance. It was too low. Even if we do, do consider like a five age group brackets, So, uh, so, so it's you know. So, so this is this is why in the in the paper as that I did present, I, I prefer something which is like a, some distribution, you know, taking all individual within the age group and creating an aggregate, you know, for inequalities. And and, and if we had to do something about a socio um, socio economic status, you know, it would be impossible, you know, to to have age profile. Or, uh, you know, to, 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 the, the average number of uh, observation, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in a survey, um, you know, um, for, 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 for a middle age group, like, uh, especially if you, you, if you take a yearly age group, like uh, at the age 50, you would have something like uh, 300 observation. Yeah. So if you decompose by age status, by 10 age status, you will have an average of uh, an average of uh, 30 observations. So you, you could not create any uh, anything that is relevant, you know, out of that. Okay. Well, I mean, this is probably issue for everyone when we break down the micro data by subtitle, uh, you know, we have a very bumpy or very noisy measure of something. So, I mean, especially when you address the issues about inequality, this is, it can be a very, very important issue. Um, 
So anyway, we are the pioneer of doing this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, and uh, also uh, probably the sensitivity analysis may, may help, right? Based on different ways of, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, you can do it uh, by different ways. Of course, uh, like a Gini coefficient versus uh, uh, income uh, percentile is a different question, but uh, you can do a lot of uh, probably uh, uh, sensitivity analysis. Okay, any comments, suggestions? I mean, from your experience, uh, Iglesia? Go ahead. Iglesia? Go ahead. Oh. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, we are in Poland exploring more and more ability to use administrative data for uh, some of the assessments. And I think it's also a very valuable uh, road to follow. Um, what we are currently doing uh, is to analyze to what extent we can use social security data, tax data, uh, that allows us to identify income by age and gender usually. The, the issue that we have is that other socioeconomic characteristics, like for example, educational, a level of educational attainment is not easy to follow. And the other challenge that we have is to actually link data for different people into households. So, so um, identify parents well, uh, but we are still, in our sort of attempts to to see to what extent different administrative sources can allow us to create households, incomes, social transfers they receive and taxes they pay. So uh, I think it's also a valuable sort of, I mean, an, an approach to follow because with administrative data, we have population data. So we don't have the problem of small samples. We have other problems that, I mean, not everything that we would like to know about individuals is available, and sometimes it is very difficult to link. But, uh, but it's another sort of part to, to looking into different kinds of data. Okay. Um, do you have any? I mean, anyone actually has some uh, very creative ideas of. Uh, uh, imputing data and uh, adding is uh, like uh, including data for profiles that, not do, that do not come from the original micro data. Do you have any experience to just take a hyun -kyung and uh, uh, yeah. And James is actually using the hand raise thing. Let it, let the record show. Okay. Where is James? <laughs> Going oh, over well, here. Okay. <laughs> okay. James. Yeah. Okay. James first then. Uh, well, I just had a comment, uh, you know, there are all these problems with using the NTA, but I think we should recognize that actually there are a lot of um, benefits too, in that most uh, like income distribution, for example, doesn't include variables that are included within the NTA as a matter of course. For example, uh, all those, uh, um, you know, public, uh, public, inc uh, public consumption provided in kind, Usually in income distribution analysis, a lot of that is not included. Also, a lot of the uh, tra the uh, taxes that we include within the NTA, like uh, um, goods and services taxes, value added taxes, that kind of thing, usually isn't included in income distribution research. So, you know, even though that there is a lot of problems, I just thought I'd mention that I do think there are um, things in the NTA that provide uh, uh variables and information that isn't usually in included in these uh distributional analyses okay that's all i wanted to say okay thank you for your comments yeah i think we probably all of us agree upon that one okay uh Hyun -Kyung, probably your last comments please be very brief okay yeah uh, i i want to share my experience to consider the public economy in my case uh, probably has economy is constructed by uh, using administrative data. So I I don't construct the age profile individually. Just use just using administrative data. So I construct the age profile directly. In addition, uh, 
uh, public education, uh, in the case of public education, I separated by type of school. So, so elementary school, middle school, high school, and university. Mm -hmm. So I separate the type of school and construct the age profile of such as elementary school between, in the case of elementary school between age six to 13. So I constructed using okay. administrative data. Yeah. Okay, if, if, if you don't have any other comments on the, the question, let's move to the last question. Uh, this is actually, I think, a uh, Ron you know, wrote this uh, question, <laughs> obviously. Uh, Ron, you actually can <laughs> unmute. Uh, really, Gretchen, these were, some of them were mine, but these were all Gretchen's. Okay, okay, <laughs> so Gretchen's question, the Gre let me just read the Gretchen's question. So subgroups, they may not included in the household surveys, like nursing home population, temporary workers, military members. So how do you handle this issue? How do you handle this problem? Gretchen, do you want to add something to this? Um, just not really. I mean, I was just trying to brainstorm, but this may be just very United States centric because we do have these large institutionalized populations. So it could be not such a big deal for most other populations. So can you just ignore them? Because uh, that's, there is a reason why we conduct, don't conduct a survey for these people. <laughs> <laughs> I would, that would make my life a lot easier. But uh, I think Bernard has uh, a comment, wants yeah. to address. Okay. Bernard? No, I think for the older people, this, this is a topic, especially since survey data often goes only until age of 80, for example, with the European income surveys. So we don't know anything for the population which is older, but it uh, increasingly becoming more important because there are more people in this older. So we have to think about something to uh, input or estimate, uh, right. for example, consumption for this group. Okay, sorry about my joke. Uh, that's a lame joke. Okay, so I mean, the one possibility is that can, do you know that like uh, health and retirement studies like HRS studies actually, uh, you know, have information on them. So what I'm saying is that if we don't have this information from our data, we probably can, you know, complement other data sets like HRS, right? Uh, and and uh, apply that measure to our NTA measure. I mean, this is a one solution, one very traditional solutions of uh, handling those kind of issues, right? So uh, that actually goes back to our own original question. Uh, you know, like uh, I mean, it's a lot of work, but uh, how do you actually merge these two data set and impute the numbers? Uh, I, I'm not sure actually whether the HRS has any time to studies actually ask the questions for the nursing home. I, I, don't, I don't remember, uh, but, but there might be some data set out there. Prisoners too, right? So, yeah, Ivan? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not, I don't, don't remember if the HRS has the information about the, the PISD, uh, do you know that? Yeah, Panasonic, we can dive next year. Yeah, I yeah, think do, yeah. that one is right. okay. populations. So we have to complement other data sets, right? Uh, we have to use other, some other data sets. Uh, but of course, there is a, a lot of a question about like a macro control too. If we, you use some other data sets and uh, incorporate, impute the number, um, how do you use, uh, like how do you split the macro control for these people? for institutionalized people. I, I, I mean, I'm just <laughs> raising issues. That's my role here right now, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, David. Well, we, you know, we had some issue in the UK when they um, introduced student loans um, and, you know, changed that basically changed how they finance tertiary education. Um, and so we had, what we had to do is we had to develop a separate profile for students because students in residences are excluded from the household surveys. So I think we used the labor force survey, if, if memory stands me uh, correct, James, I, I don't remember. So it was the labor force survey. Um, and then we just developed a profile for that group of people. And, and then, you know, 
use the labor force survey to estimate the proportion of each age that was actually at university and then just brought the profile in at its expected value so that's how we did it for for that group so it's not just the it's not just the old where, where there's this problem right. and another question is whether these institutionalized people are already allocated like a per capita basis like military people uh how they are is probably if we, they use federal is uh, the you know budget uh, whatever i mean i don't know how how to handle that actually in the in in, in our nta um <laughs> it's probably already allocated by per capita <laughs> basis uh it's public consumption <laughs> public other consumption maybe i don't know i mean so we have to know how it's actually yeah handled i mean budget. yeah and same question for, or same issue for the prison population, the costs of, you know, what that population is consuming is allocated as a per cap, as part of other, you know, in-kind public. Right. Okay. Does there any other, uh, any other country have these issues about institut institutionalized people? Yeah, Bernard, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. you mentioned that on. Sorry. It's not uh, about, can I uh, raise another issue, yeah, which was yeah. before? It's because of this imputation of consumption. So there are, of course, methods to combine uh, consumption data and income data. And this is, this, this is fine when you aggregate them afterwards. You can, for example, have in an income survey, the, uh, the consumption in two weeks periods. So Eurostat does it, for example, and it, it gives fine values if you aggregate them afterwards. But in NTA, we have direct, we have to use directly the imputed values to calculate the intra-household transfers. So the problem is a little bit, uh, there's some additional problems we have to face or we face when we calculate the NTA microdata, because we are using directly this microdata to estimate this intra-household transfers without any further aggregation. So this is, so we can combine the two data sources, so work from other people will help us. But then we have only in income service, which measure the income in a given year, we still have this two week Con also this consumption in two weeks in this survey. And this we cannot use to reliable estimate the intra-household transfers. So we need some uh, methods, uh, what we do. Uh, actually about an hour ago, I sent you an email, Bernardo. So there is a, one interesting randomization events. I mean, it's a case of India and uh, in India, they changed uh, this uh, method. So from like uh, two weeks, and that they actually changed it in 2000 and they also changed 2011 and see how what's the effect of this change in reference period so you must actually read the paper because it's so interesting i don't actually i mean recognize any other papers but that kind of issue is very very important because uh, you know depend you know there is a recall bias of course and uh, you know, some consumptions is, is not made within two weeks or something like that but that's very very actually detailed and so technical. Um, let's see, actually we, we have so many questions, but uh, how do you move from here? That's another question, right? So actually, can you, can everybody just send us some questions to, to Ron or and maybe Gretchen, sorry, Gretchen, that's what you probably want to discuss further and make subgroups to discuss or we can discuss in May 11. Actually, David, do you have any comments on this? Well, I, I just wanted to ask Gretchen about the, those, um, you know, the, the, the distributions that you had, you know, you showed the distributions, which is really interesting. And did, did you, do you have any sense about how, how the spread of the distribution is affected by the issue mentioned by Bernard? I, you know, I don't know anything about the US consumption surveys. Is consumption measured over a two week period in your survey? So different items are measured with different periodicity. There are things that are uh, measured in daily research, like certain kinds of food. And then there are 
uh, things that are asked about on a monthly basis, like clothes and then annual basis uh, for some items. So it varies and it's all sort of, and, and the surveys are done. When you're in the survey, they're checking back with you every single month for like three months. And, and it's a rolling, uh, rolling sample, moving people in and out during uh, those three months. So it's kind of a mishmash. And I, uh, I'm not very up to speed on how that would affect um, these pieces. Right. Because if you've got a rolling three month and it's a longitudinal survey, then in principle you could test the the autocorrelation of the different consumption measures by category, and you could assess how much of your range is due to this issue raised by Bernard, and how much is actually real. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, if you found if you did that exercise and you found that there wasn't much, that you know, in fact, that that the, the you know, presumably they they do these measures because. Uh, over different periods related to the frequency of, of purchase, I would guess. So less frequently purchased items, they ask you over a longer period. Yeah. And, and, and to deal with precisely this issue, I guess. Um, so it would be interesting to see the, and, and hopefully they've done a good enough job that we wouldn't need to worry about, at least for the US. For the UK, as, as I understand it, all consumption is measured over a two week period. Mm. Means that if we do this, we've got a serious problem. Uh, potentially, anyway, depending on how negatively autocorrelated these consumption measures are over over successive two week periods. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, Ron, um, on some of these matters, I wonder if there could be any payoff to taking a more active role in relation to the uh, design of the surveys. I wonder if there's any, any possibility of changing the way governments do these surveys and also uh, the way they release the data. I, do, I, I know in the US, we used to be able to get much better old age data, I think up to 90 or 95 or something, but then they went to 80 because of increasing concerns about uh, privacy, confidentiality, and because they're small numbers. But of course, the numbers are growing. And well, I was going to say, of course, in NTA, we don't really use them at the individual level, but we're talking precisely about using them at the individual level now. Still, the numbers in those uh, older age groups are growing. I, I don't know. Uh, could there be any possibility of influencing the surveys? Occasionally, we've been approached in NTA for suggestions. I don't think by the government, but uh, for the HRS type surveys uh, for Tiger, I think it is in India and uh, Charles in China, they've inquired and uh, uh, we don't need to be completely passive in relation to them. It might be worth some sort of effort. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, actually, this is uh, also a policy relevant question. Why in some countries like the UK, you still have a use like a two weeks right recall period. But in, in, especially in India, they changed the three times already. And why? Because uh, to measure like their you know, percentage below poverty line, you cannot use this two week reference. So they used actually uh, 30 days. Then in 2000, they changed it entirely. In 2011, they changed it again. So because they needed the number. <laughs> so they are very desperate to get this correct number using, you know, different uh, reference period. So probably UK is not that desperate. Uh. <laughs> okay, but this is a very, very important issue. So, okay, so time is actually just uh, flying. So uh, if you have any other questions, uh, James, Sefton, you, did you raise James? Uh, just quickly on Ron's point, and then they top coded in the UK as well at 80, so they changed oh. it because of the privacy issues. Right. But then they introduced secure access to dedicated researchers 
So they allowed dedicated, you could have to fill in various forms and go on training exercises and so on. But then you allowed the raw data again and you can see the older age group. So it was like they put it behind a protective screen mm -hmm. to try and get around this problem. I don't know. Um, it was on this imputation, a couple of two comments really, really, very really quickly on the imputation. Um, in the UK, we're, we're trying to look at sort of a bit like Bernard's point, why the savings ratio is negative for young people. Um, there's a lot of, we believe that we really underestimate private transfers uh, between households, capital, private capital transfers. And one example was there was a student survey and they looked at all the inter vivas transfers for the students. And that was twice as much as for the whole, whole aggregate population within the, uh, if you like, the uh, normal uh, consumption survey. So, and then you've got all Piketty's recent results about gifts and so on, private transfers. Again, he estimates they're almost of the size of bequests. So when you sum up the capital sum of all the intervivus transfers gifts, it is roughly the same as amount as transferred during bequests, which is a huge sum of money um, that's getting transferred between households. So my big question was, uh, so, so I had two questions. One was why don't we look more at capital transfers? And why, do we, why was the decision taken to drop the capital account out of the NTA? So why don't we look at changes in net worth rather than gross uh, net savings was the first question. So, you know, can't we go further down the, down the uh, national accounts? And the second one was really right going back to Ron's original presentation when he talked about inequality. What is our comparative advantage versus the sort of dis distributional national accounts of Zuckman and Zayez that's also coming out of Berkeley? So. So those are the two questions I wanted to throw out there. Capital transfers and the distribution of national accounts. Well, uh, these questions can be actually discussed in May 11, if uh, you want to continue. Uh, the Zuckerman, I mean, this is actually a fundamental question. Several people actually, I mean, raised this issue. So we have, uh, it's not written here, but we have some separate agenda. Uh, it's probably too big to discuss it today, I guess. I mean, we don't have much time. Ron, do you want to actually respond to James' uh, question or do you want to actually uh, postpone the discussion? I uh, agree with your answer. Let's, let's keep it on the table and let's talk about it next week. And on the capital account, I would like, uh, uh, I think Andy has worked on uh, capital accounts and of course James and David have, uh, maybe others have as well, but um, I'd like to hear from uh, Andy, but uh, maybe next uh, next week, uh, because I think we're running out of steam now. But uh, while I'm speaking, I also wanted to encourage everybody who's um, still here to, um, if, if you have any work you think might be appropriate to present next week, uh, please email to the four organizers um, and, uh, and, and mention it. Uh, many of you have already submitted uh, questions you thought would be good to discuss. They have not been overlooked. They're on a list and uh, we will come to those uh, next week. Um, and maybe I'll get in touch with you. Maybe you'd like to lead a discussion about some of them yourselves. Um, but if others of you uh, have questions you'd like to see discussed or have ideas of maybe you know someone else's work uh, that uh, could uh, be good to have them present, please uh, contact us about it. This very interesting question James raises about the um, national distributional accounts of uh, Sayas and Zuckman and uh, PPT and so on. Uh, we did a little uh, comparison, really Andy did a comparison and there's a nice little table we have uh, showing the differences and uh, 
uh, I think we should take that up next week too, because this question of where our comparative advantage in NTI lies is critically important. We don't want to waste our time doing things that other people have already done or could do better with different uh, uh, platforms. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense to spend some effort thinking about those issues carefully. Um, okay. There aren't really, well, let me say one more word about next time. I think both Alexia and Sio um, raised the question that Sio raised again today about uh, confidence intervals for uh, NTA profiles. And uh, Yvonne has done work on that. And I'm going to try to persuade Yvonne to uh, share some of his uh, work with us uh, next week. But otherwise, I don't have any presentations uh, in mind. I'd love to hear of some. I'd love to have some volunteers. Possibly Julien uh, said you had something sort of relevant, but you didn't think it was exactly on target. Anyway, perhaps we can put together a, a program, just in, but it has to be very quick because we need to get this organized, uh, you know, in the next day or two. Okay. Thanks, that's all I'm gonna say. Okay, I think that concludes our session. You know, he, uh, uh, Ron actually mentioned the, the kind of gave some announcement and the next week's topic. So if you don't wanna uh, actually continue to discuss, uh, I mean, I'd like to conclude. Uh, 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 we are four organizers, but actually Gretchen and Ron did most of the things. So Gretchen, you wanna say something? The last word, good night, good evening, good morning or whatever. <laughs> Um, I, my last evening will be, or last word of the evening will be to thank everybody for coming, for sitting on a Zoom call for this long, and uh, to please welcome all of your feedback about how we can do this better, um, about how we can change it up, make it more useful, um, make it more fun, make it uh, more creative. Uh, anything because uh, this is we're sort of stuck here but we can make some lemonade out of this situation because certainly this is insanely easy to see all of you people from all over the world through this little box and uh, so there are great opportunities uh, being able to use this format thanks <laughs>